Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Brandon Zupancic, Global Business Development and Partner Strategy at Elemental Technologies. We're pleased you could join us for another installment of our Elemental Insights webcast series. Two brief notes. We will refer to 4K, UHD, and ultra-high-definition television interchangeably throughout this webcast. Second, if you would like to submit a question, you may submit one at any time using your GoToWebcast application. We will compile questions and answer them toward the end of the webcast. Here's our agenda for today's webcast. With literally billions of dollars of investment going towards serving up premium 4K content, service providers and content owners must ensure that 4K viewing experiences are truly superior. But with the opportunity to provide audience, audiences an immersive experience comes risk. Much of the premium 4K video on offer is high motion, high frame rate content that presents inherently greater potential for visual artifacts than lower resolution video. A careful, comprehensive approach to 4K content preparation and delivery requires capable video processing and measurement platforms, as well as the knowledge to properly configure these tools for optimal results. In this live webcast, we will discuss the most common pitfalls in preparing and delivering 4K content, best practices for ensuring the highest quality video processing and delivery, and key metrics for monitoring and ensuring the best quality of experience. I'd like to introduce now our subject matter experts. Joining us from Elemental Technologies is Tom Gilman, Technical Marketing Manager. Tom's 18 plus years of experience with digital video networks have afforded him the opportunity to work across networks of all types, including cable, satellite, terrestrial, IPTV, and OTT. Prior to joining Elemental, Tom worked at Motorola, Tut Systems, iBeam Broadcasting, Harmonic, and Divicom. Tom has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Computer Science from California State Polytechnic University. Joining us from InneoQuest Technologies is Michael Campbell, Director of Product Management. Michael has had a wide-ranging career in telecom technology and digital, digital media. Prior to joining InneoQuest, Michael worked at Nortel and Tektronix Communications. Michael's current focus is digital media, where he has worked in the areas of VoIP, conversational video, linear streaming video, and adaptive bitrate video. Michael holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Queen's University, Canada, and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of British Columbia. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Brandon. And, uh, thank you to everyone in the audience this morning for participating in this event. Before we get started, we'd like to get your All right, before we get started, we would like to get your opinion. So you should see on your screen now a poll question and a series of potential answers for that question. Please look over the answers, pick the answer that best represents your thinking on the question and submit that. We will tabulate those answers during the webcast and we'll come back and review them with you a little bit later. So here's the question. If you're a pay TV operator, what is the greatest challenge you are faced with in offering 4K service to your customers? Okay. All right. So, so oh, <laughs> with that, Tom, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, 4K sets and 4K content? Sure. So we're going to set the stage here for 4K video. The, the trend you can see here is there's a lot of 4Ks coming out. You'll see them at Costco and Best Buy and everywhere else. <clears throat> Um, so you'll see a tremendous amount of 4K TVs out in the world, out in people's homes. The prices are coming down. The, the TVs themselves are getting bundled with other things like mm -hmm. Xboxes and Playstations, yeah. making it even more affordable. And another side note on the delivery side is the manufacturing costs are not much more than an HD flat panel. Mm -hmm. So all this leads to a big growth in 4K TVs. That's uh, actually buttressed by the Consumer Electronics Association. This year in their 4K Ultra HD update study, they found that over 33% of subscribers who were looking at purchasing a TV are considering a 4K TV. They also found that 
Another 44% or so are looking at what they call a smart TV. And a smart TV, of course, is frequently associated with 4K. So at least a third and arguably up to two-thirds of all subscribers looking at buying a new TV are potentially buying a 4K TV. So there's going to be a lot of 4K TVs out there, and that's actually good news for everybody because there's also going to be a lot of 4K content for them to consume. Courtesy of our friends at Cisco, we know that the uh, global growth rate for 4K content is about 14% year over year. And what that means to all of us is that by 2019, up to 21% of total video traffic will be 4K traffic. Okay. So there's a lot of sets, there's a lot of content for them to consume, and uh, that's, uh, that's a great thing for 4K. So what does that mean to operators? So 4K, there's a lot of different components here. Mm -hmm. So there's a big bandwidth jump from HD, anywhere from uh, what we're seeing probably around the 14 to 35 megabit range. Um, it goes hand in hand with a new codec. There's a frame rate upgrade a lot of times. Um, people have this big set, they want to see good quality video. The, the content's coming along. Um, delivering this high bit rate content Content is another challenge. Um, I'm not going to even talk about things like HDR, which is a whole other <laughs> yeah. webcast. That's a whole other webinar. Yep. <laughs> um, and then just the, the bandwidth required for a single 4K stream. So I'm going to now hand it off to you mm -hmm. to talk about some of the common pitfalls for 4K video. Okay. Let's start with uh, the first pitfall. The first, for, <laughs> pissed first ball. The first pitfall is um, actually, I think, simply stated as the misunderstanding that the network settings, the encoder settings, every other form of setting that is delivering what you consider to be a visually excellent experience for HD will do the same thing for UHD. And and while it's a common misunderstanding, it's actually not true at all. For, for two really significant reasons. The first is that the higher data rate associated with 4K means that any defects that are present at a, at a, at a, a rate-based mechanism are going to show up more frequently per screen. And of course, that screen is just physically bigger, so you're going to see more of those things. Uh, and what you see is the usual suspects, pixelation, macro blocking, blurring, um, things yep. of that nature. And th this is actually a real problem because when you think about your average consumer, they've paid more for that TV. It's, they've, they've bought a premium device. Yeah. Um, they've been sold more by their operator. They're expecting that they've purchased a high-quality premium service. And fundamentally, they expect more. They've paid more. They've been sold more. They expect more. So it's absolutely critical that the network be engineered to deliver that experience or you're going to have a very disappointed customer. Yes. So this is, of course, driven home, I think, both historically and currently by uh, DSL forum TR-126. I'm not going to read the, uh, the little excerpt we have here, but it basically says that for any given defect, let's, let's consider packet loss rate in the network, for any given defect that is rate-based, that defect is going to show up more often in, in, uh, in a higher rate media form, like 4K, than it would in a lower one like HD, simply because the data rate itself is larger. And more of those are going to accumulate per visual image on the screen because the screen is simply larger. So you're going to have more things happening per frame, if you will, and they're going to be more visible. And that's, that's really the point that this thing makes. Now, this was a 2006 study. It right. related to the next big thing that was happening at that time, SD to HD. But right. those lessons are equally applicable to today's transition from right. HD to UHD. Even more so. Even more so, yeah, because it's quite a significant jump. Okay. <clears throat> So, one of the best practices here is setting tighter monitoring thresholds to detect um, those rate-based defects. So tighter in the network in the head end and tighter on the edge. So that's, that's a good point, Tom. So rate-based defects have a way of accumulating as you go through the network. The more elements that you pass through, the more likely it is that you're going to see these kind of things creeping in. And I just wanted to mention that uh, IneoQuest's line of QoS probes, which really I would characterize as covering from the head end right to the edge, 
uh, and this includes Cingulus, Geminus, and our newest probe, Surveyor. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are ideally suited to the job of detecting that as, it, as the video progresses through the network. So that's, that's another potential best practice, is just monitor from the head end all the way to the edge and correlate that with what you're seeing at the head end to come up with a good end-to-end -end view and be able to detect where these things are happening. Right. And then on the, the video side itself, we have different modes of rate control of the video. Mm -hmm. And each mode is set based on the network type. So a constant bitrate video for over the top, okay. an unmanaged network, mm -hmm. um, that's what we would suggest. A variable bitrate network for a managed network, kind of a MSO or service provider. Sure. And then a statistical multiplexed uh, video signal for cable satellite, uh, terrestrial networks where you have a constrained bitrate pipe. Okay. Okay, good. So those are some of the best practices for avoiding that first pitfall. Okay. So I see that we have the results in for our poll, first poll question. So the question, just to reiterate it, was if you're a pay TV operator, what is the greatest challenge you face in delivering a 4K service to your subscribers? And looking at the results that's come in, we see, see that uh, number two, the network resources required to deliver 4K, uh, is something that is of concern to 46% of you. Um, another 29% are concerned that there's not enough 4K content available yet to enable the, uh, to, to really incent customers to go do this. So that's, uh, that's actually quite in line with some of the pitfalls we're talking about here. It makes sense. It's, it's more bits to mm -hmm. travel <coughs> and... Uh, you have the TVs on one side, but you need the content on the other. So mm -hmm. the content's coming. We're starting to see it roll yeah, out here. Yeah. So I think we can see that the uh, the audience is concerned with a lot of the things that, uh, that that we're talking about here. Yep. So let's go on to the next pitfall. Uh, the next pitfall, simply stated, is over compression. And I think the uh, the root cause of over compression in this situation mm -hmm. is just that there are. Um, there's a natural tendency to want to try and use that same physical plant that exists today to deliver video to, uh, to deliver 4K video. Uh, and that plant may have a restricted bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I just don't want to, as an operator, spend the additional capital. I think we saw that in one of these things. Yeah. Uh, spend the additional capital to increase the available bandwidth for these things. And so what I end up doing is attempting to squash too wide a signal into too narrow a pipe. Right. Uh, and that actually takes all forms of guises. We've listed four of them here on this chart. Uh, at the head end, you can look at transcoder resources where you may want to scrimp on that mm -hmm. to, to achieve the most economy possible. Um, there are, of course, ingress controls on uh, some CDN networks, which, yep. which may actually force you to, uh, to use a, uh, a narrower signal than you would like. And then, of course, let's not forget the last mile network. Um, certainly a lot of operators, we've all seen Google's one, yeah. one gigabit to the home, and everybody's raced to achieve the same thing. But if you're on a DSL long loop, you may be restricted to what you can do. Yep. And, and you may simply be forced to overcompress the, uh, the 4K signal to right. do that. So what does this cause? This causes all the same things, of course, that, you, that we've talked about before. Um, all the visible artifacts like pixelation, macro blocking, blurring, all of those things are, uh, are a direct consequence of this sort of thing. Yep. So okay. what can we do about that? <laughs> well, the, the chart we're showing here on the, the bottom right is about the codex. Yeah. So um, almost going right to left, we have HEVC coming on strong here in 2013. We're now at 2015. That really has gone hand in hand with 4K video. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. not a lot of 4K H.264 video, simply because the bit rate to send H.264 4K video is really big for the same quality as HBC. We have some of that running in our lab. It's about 150 to 175 megabits. Okay. That's a, that's a wide signal. That's a big <laughs> signal. Um, so to get the, the quality you need, and particularly for the sports content, at this higher frame rate, then it's HEVC is what, is what we're seeing almost 100%. So there's actually two really good points there, Tom. Um, HEVC oven by itself is something we need to think about because right. it's, a, it's a pretty immature technology relative to AVC. And that means that the implementations you're going to get from encoder vendors um, are potentially going to be less mature than mm -hmm. those for H.264. 
that can do all sorts of nasty things, um, you know, just causing compression artifacts because they're, they're not, all the corner cases are not dealt with properly. Right. Uh, HEVC is, I understand, four to five times more computationally complex to compress than, uh, than AVC. You may actually see things like poor scheduling of CPU resources leading to bursty transmission, mm -hmm. uh, starving of other channels on the same encoder. There's all kinds of things to think about here, so you have to be very, very careful in your choice of encoder vendors to ensure that that is not an issue. Yep. And then I think the other thing, you, you, you mentioned sports. That's, uh, that's another really, really key issue here. So we've been talking about all the potential problems that can come up with 4K. Mm -hmm. And what's the marquee content that people are putting out there? They're putting out sports. Right. Live action, lots of motion, you know, quarterback throws the ball, the yep. camera pans. This is an encoder's worst nightmare. Yep. Uh, and so this is, <laughs> this is certainly something that, that is, again, absolutely critical to make sure that your network is engineered all the way through to keep up with this sort of thing because it's really going to stress the network. Remember the consumers bought more, been sold yep. more, expects more. You better right. deliver or you're going to have an unhappy subscriber. Exactly. Okay, so we're going to move on to the demonstration. I'm going first, so what I wanted to show in my demonstration, we have two for, for my piece, is um, the three different modes of rate control. Mm -hmm. So it's very simple. Um, I'll start off with the constant bit rate. We have a 4K video here uh, on the top part. So I'll scroll up so you can see some of the settings there. So there's the 4K resolution. 384, 3, 3840 by 2160. Um, rate control, constant bit rate of 15. Other modes, so constant bit rate would be good for those IPTV networks mm -hmm. or over the top content. Um, a variable bit rate, if you have a managed network where you have more control over each router in the, in the pipeline sure. or each yep. access device. Very simple, you have a max bit rate as well as a bit rate, target bit rate. And then for our statistical multiplex customers, they add the minimum bit rate. So sure, you kind of yep. set the range that this channel can swing between mm -hmm. um, from a high and a low, and then you give it a target, basically. And the target helps you set the, um, the priority of those channels in a statistical multiplex okay. pool of channels. So that's this demo. I'm going to hand it off to you for okay. your side. All right. So what we've been talking about thus far then is um, is not getting this plugged in properly. There you go. Um, very good. <laughs> we, we've been certainly talking about engineering both resources, bit rates, and various other things to make sure that this operates mm -hmm. properly. Um, it is important that you monitor the net result of all this to ensure that that is actually delivering what you expect it to, and you should yep. be monitoring pre and post MUX typically. Um, so at this point, let's have a look at, um, yes, indeed, let's, ha let's have a look at monitoring this sort of thing with uh, IneoQuest's DVA. So what I am showing here is a list of, uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm logged into a, a DVA in our lab. Um, I've got a 4K stream running here. And the great thing about, uh, we're talking about compression here, the great thing about DVA is that we can actually directly observe compression. So let's, let's go have a look at that. So I'm going to a uh, capability called visual trending, which lets me look at a 15 minute interval of data in really detailed way. Okay. Uh, and what I can see here, um, and as you can see, I'm, I'm picking on a sports game yeah, here. Uh, what you can see here for, for compression levels is we can look at this by I-frame, by B-frame, and eventually by P-frame. And gosh, there's not much interesting happening here. Mm -hmm. So this is all fairly flat line. And you'd probably expect that because this is HEVC and it's a 26 megabit channel. So okay. there's probably not a whole lot interesting going on there. But let's look at one that, uh, that I'm pretty sure would be of some interest. If I look at some 500 kilobit channels, do the same thing. So let's go back to visual trending for that. Again, look at the compression levels for it. And you can start to see a little bit happening there on the iframes. On the B-frames, we're starting to see a little bit more and hopefully a little bit more on the P-frames. But you can directly observe, this is not compression per se, this is what I would call over-compression. So we're looking okay. at a variety of things and, and measuring essentially abnormal compression. And you can view that directly here on DVA. Hmm. 
So, okay. so let's go back to the charts. All right. We're now at pitfall number three. And pitfall number three is, uh, is all about uh, excessively variable encoder output. And this can be both excessively variable bit rate and excessively variable packet emission rate. Right. Um, and I think we've talked a little bit about HEVC and the compression complexity and the right. amount of CPU that that requires. One of the things that can happen there in a poorly designed real-time system is that the encoder will actually work away for a while, stack up a whole bunch of packets, spit those right. out, go silent, work a little while longer, do that again. Yep. And what you get is huge bursts of traffic with, yep. with silent intervals in between. And we have actually seen that. Yep. I'm, I'm happy to report to the audience, by the way, we have an elemental encoder in our lab, and it doesn't do this. Yay. So, so that's, that's great. <laughs> um, but we have seen that, and what happens then is you get great spikes in traffic, and that is really hard on routers and all the intermediate network elements along right. the way. Anything potentially, with a, anything with a buffer. Anything with a buffer could yep. potentially get overrun by this, and that includes the set-top box at home. Yep. Uh, so the uh, you know the, the this is sort of the the impact of highly variable packet emission rate. Now the same thing is also true of a highly variable bit rate. And, and let's go back to that long loop DSL connection we were talking about. Right. If you have a variable bit rate encoder that is that is again kind of spiking up a fair amount and mm -hmm. you just exceed the bandwidth available to your home because right. you're on a long loop DSL, right. guess what? You have all the same problems happening again. Yep. So okay. that's uh, that's sort of pitfall number three okay. in a nutshell. And of course, as we've said, that again is going to produce a lot of visual artifacts, um, blurring, yep. ringing, all sorts of things that you can think of associated with that sort of stuff. So. What can we do about this? Uh, well, there's, there's some obvious things we can yep. do about this. The first thing we can do, I think, is just make sure, look, looking at what you could do with your encoder, make sure that you have set those nominal and maximum bit rates to, to suit the, the really the worst case conditions in your right. network yep. so that you don't have subscribers who are getting into trouble with that sort of thing. Um, from the packet emission burstiness thing, I think you need to monitor. Yep. You need to monitor again, um, not only at the rate right at the output of the encoder, but also because you're going through anything with a buffer, right. that could actually exacerbate the problem because it may actually be buffering and dealing with it differently. So you really need to look at that throughout the network as well. Right. And uh, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention the ability to do this with uh, with EnioQuest QoS probe line. Gotcha. So, okay, yeah, the the uh, variable bit rate component can be tough. Um, you have to take into account the lows and the highs, mm -hmm. um, but the managed network part gives those operators the more control over each network component. So that's why we do suggest the variable bit rate to get you the, sure. you know, the better yeah. video quality because the bit rate can swing depending on the complexity of the video that's being encoded. Yeah, that's actually a, a good point to, to think about is that in the end, the performance of all of this stuff is content related. Right. Um, you know, we talked about sports causing a lot of trouble here, but but in general, just because you set something up, you test it in your lab, and it's working well, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work well all the time. It depends right. on the content that you're displaying. Yep. So you probably need to be monitoring this stuff full time all the time because you never know when something's going to come along that's going to start tripping thresholds. Right. So. Yep. So okay. while we're still talking about variable packet emission rate, we have a demo. Uh, and like compression, this is something that we can look at directly on DBA. Okay. So we can actually directly observe the, uh, that nature of the traffic. Yeah. So let's have a look at that. Okay. So what I am showing here again is, uh, is a channel listing from a DBA in okay. our lab. And let's just have a look at this, uh, this one HEVC channel here. Again, this is, this is a sports game. Um, there is a, um, a you, you may remember in 2006, InioQuest um, developed something called MDI. The media I do delivery. remember. You do remember that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it, of course, is the media loss rate and the delay factor. One of the things that goes into the delay factor is a term we call virtual buffer. Okay. And this is really quite simply explained. This is the size of the playback buffer needed at the receiving device okay. to provide smooth playback of video. Okay. And in the real world, in the ideal world, I'm sorry, yeah. Maybe not the real world. I am receiving packets at the same rate that I'm displaying them. Right. Because I've got nice regular packets coming to me. And so I should never need more than a one packet buffer or about 1,500 bytes. So what okay. you see here is the size of that buffer. And if the, uh, 
encoder is performing well, this number should be in the 1500, 2000 region, yep. with the exception of uh, variable bit rate, where it okay. can be, of course, by definition, it can be all over the place. Right. Uh, and I think you can see, let's just kind of sc scroll this down a little bit and have a look at uh, uh, two encoders that we've got running in our lab here. Okay. Um, you can see that, again, with the exception of this variable bit rate one, encoder one, which I, I think I can tell the audience is, is your encoder, okay. it's an elemental encoder, uh, is performing pretty well. This is you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of yep. one packet of buffer, and that's it. Uh, encoder two, just another encoder that we have running in the lab. Slightly different story here. We're seeing some much larger numbers. Okay. Um, I won't reveal who the, sure. who the vendor is, but we can see that this encoder is doing exactly what we were talking about. It's sort okay. of bursting and going silent and bursting and going silent. That's bad behavior. Gotcha. So with DVA, we can directly observe this sort of stuff, okay. and, and that's, uh, that, that's a good thing to monitor and, uh, and to keep your eyes on. So let's go back to the charts. Okay. We are ready for poll question number two. And poll, You're going to read it. Yeah, poll question number two. Uh, again, you should see this on the right-hand side of your screen, along with a potential set of answers. Uh, please, again, just like last time, select the answer that you think is closest to, to your thinking on this question and submit it, and we'll chat about the results a little bit later in the webcast. So the question is, if you're an operator or an online video provider, an OVP, uh, when is your company planning to launch 4K service? Yep. Let's move on to the next pitfall. Okay, the pitfall number four, the varying quality of output streams, of adaptive bitrate output streams. Um, we have seen adaptive bitrate 4K streams where you have a 4K at the high end, mm -hmm. and then you have an HD, and then maybe another HD, maybe an SD, and then smaller cell phone resolution. Sure. Um, yep. And if those aren't planned right, you will see jumps when they switch resolutions. Mm -hmm. um, one other note about different adaptive bit rate profiles we've seen is we've seen multiple 4Ks, where you have a 4K P60 with a 4K P30, sure, and then maybe yeah. jump down to an HD. So that the, the person who bought this premium TV, even if their bandwidth in their house degrades, then sure. they get a 4K signal still. Mm -hmm. Um, before dropping down to these smaller bit rates. The, the issues we've seen on this is switching between the videos. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just the bit rate itself, but we have seen issues with the resolutions not matching. Mm -hmm. So you might go from a 16 by 9 to a 4 by 3. So you're going to get a jarring discontinuity, a jarring discontinuity when, you, on when, the, you, when you gear shift? Yep, yep. exactly. Now, you know, we've actually observed in a number of the customers that we are in um, kind, of, kind of a related issue there where the operator is doing exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So they've got six or eight different variants of, uh, of an AVR set. Uh, and to save money in their monitoring arrangement, they're perhaps monitoring the top one, the bottom one, maybe the middle one. Okay. And they're just assuming the other ones are okay. If right. You, if, you, if you manage that, you're Which probably okay. Which is assuming the CDN is okay and the origin server is okay and there's a lot of other okay things lot of, in yeah. that pipe. Which, which may not be true, right? Yeah. I think I think what's true in software, what you don't test doesn't work, right. is also true in video. Right. What you what you haven't monitored probably isn't clean. Right. So so I think you know a, a potential best practice that mm -hmm. we're going to get into here in a minute is you have to look at all of this stuff because you don't really know what's going on there. Yep. Well, now then. another very practical issue we've seen with some of our customers is they're already doing ABR. Okay. Uh, and so they've got a set of typically um, AVC related stuff, you know, HD, SD, and so on going on. Uh, and then they want to add one or two 4K variants to this. Ah. And so they go buy another encoder. Right. And now suddenly I have two encoders with two different quality controls right. um, contributing to the same ABR set. Gotcha. And unless you're really careful about that, when you gear shift from the one to the other, unless you're monitoring this very carefully, those jarring discontinuities can come in again because it's two different mechanisms for controlling the quality. Right. Um, which leads us to the best practices. Mm -hmm. I jumped the gun a little bit on you. That's all right. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, what, what's the obvious best practice here? The right. obvious best practice is to monitor all of the variants of, uh, of, an, of an ABR output set and, yep. uh, you know, make sure that everything is okay. Yep. Um, and then number two, I would say... It's possible to use one encoder for all the adaptive bit sure. rate yeah. outputs. And there's also scenarios when that's not possible. So the, the, the thing you want to do there is you want to make sure that the both encoders are in sync. 
so that the, the GOPs are referenced to each other, mm -hmm. so that any changes between those outputs between the two encoders will automatically stay synchronized so there's no judder sure. on yep. the playback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something we do. And of course, you have a mechanism for doing that. Yep. Yeah. In between so encoders. We call it GOP locking. GOP locking. I don't think there's a term in the industry for it, but that's mm -hmm. what we call it. Okay. Okay. Next is the demonstration. I'm going to take the sure. HDMI back. Thank you. Okay. Oops. Not that one. Okay. What this is showing, this is our Elemental Live um, kind of high-end 4K encoder. Mm -hmm. And on the same machine, we're doing a 4K, an HD, and an SD resolution. I just picked those. Yeah. Um, this could be part of a unified head end so that you have the 4K streaming out to somewhere. Then you have maybe your HD and SD is going to a different IPTV network. Okay, so sure. Can, and then as well as those same signals, if we had designed it the right, pushing to the over-the-top side. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a high level. We have the one machine doing all these different variants. Um, just a, a kind of a sports. deeper look. Everything is We've got some sports. <laughs> yep. And then, of course, this is the Portland Trailblazers here. A um, little bit more. I just picked these bit rates at random. It would be if you were streaming an over-the-top service with adaptive bit rate. Sure. Um, so that's that's my demo here. Is really just showing the one, one rack unit machine doing these three different bit rates. Doing all of this. So a so a best practice very definitely is if you're adding 4K to an existing set of ABR lineup, it is good to re-engineer that so it's all on the same encoder, so that you're right. getting a consistent set of quality controls. Yep. And I'm going to hand it back to you. Okay, and I'm going to demo the ability to uh, to to just look at all of the elements of an ABR set together and observe that. Uh, you know all of all the relative quality measurements for them, so okay. that you can see that all is all is well with that. So we're back again to the uh, the encoder list that I was talking about here. So we're looking at all of the channels coming off a particular encoder. Okay. And let's just have a look at uh, the complete set that we have here. And if I just uh, type in, you know, in this case, we've got we've got all. Excuse me. When I learn how to type, I'll carry on. <laughs> um, we can, uh, simply by engineering the aliases for, uh, for the set, you can okay. just type in the name of the set. This, nice. is, a, this is a simple mechanism yep. for doing this. And you can actually look at the entire thing. Uh, and you can see all the quality metrics we were talking about, the MOS, the, uh, we were talking about this virtual buffer term. Okay. Um, there's a lot of things available in terms of availability. Um, okay. you know, for and this example, is each... I can walk bit rate out of the adaptive bit out of, rate out of the adaptive set profile. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you you can look at the availability, you can look at historical performance, you can look at the entire set at a glance. Okay. And uh, and be able to see everything that you want. So so that's uh, that's really. Of course, you can alarm on this. You don't have to watch it like right. this. Uh, but I just wanted to demonstrate what you can actually see. So let's okay. go back to the charts. Okay. So. This one is is uh, tricky and yeah. comes up <laughs> out in the field often. Um, the group of pictures misaligned across adaptive bitrate output streams. So the issue you'll see here is when you're watching at home, you can actually notice when the bitrate changes on the video stream. It's not smooth. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the symptom. There's a skip or a jump or something's not playing back right. Sure. Yeah. So the, the adaptive bit rate outputs, the, they are not lined up when they're playing back correctly. So those six streams, for example, mm -hmm. when they're playing back, they're just not perfectly matched. So the segments are not lined up with each other in time? Right. The segments are not lined up each other in time. Um, this becomes even trickier with things like ad insertion. Oh, sure. Because yeah. at any... You know, ad insertion is based on a particular time that the mm -hmm. ad plays, not based on a video um, or a time of, of the scene in the video. It's more of, hey, at this time I have to play this ad, mm -hmm. which might lead to changing the fragment size and the segment sizes. So realigning all of those across the adaptive bit rate outputs, and making sure the outputs are consistent and the, um, the, the encoder packet size is right is, is not, not easy. And it's not easy with 4K video. Sure. 
So. Now, now, do you see cases where the uh, it's not always 4K when they insert the ad? 4K with say HD being an ad, yep. or or you know any other form of different resolution? Yep, you'll see that all the you time. See that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. I'm going to move on. All right. So best practices for dealing with this one. So make sure the the GOPs are aligned. Absolutely. So that's the yep. GOPs is groups of pictures. Um, we spent a lot of time, a lot of energy on this. And kind of back to the previous slide, there's two ways you can do it. You can make sure the um, all the encodes are on the same box. Sure. Plus, the software has to be smart enough to know to do that. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And then the third option there is if you're using encoders or streams on different encoders, you might do that for redundancy. You might do that for capacity. Mm -hmm. Then you have to make sure those two encoders are talking to each other so they can synchronize that segment across all outputs. Sure. Makes sense. So I believe we have a demo of this. Uh, not on my side, actually. Not on your side? Okay. Yep. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a very brief demo here. So okay. like everything else about DVA, we can directly observe right. that, uh, that segment alignment. For me, it's hard to show that. <laughs> that segments are lined up. <laughs> but but, but we, we can actually show that. So we're going we're gonna to cut to a demo on that. Um, and I'm just going to jump over very quickly to uh, to a view of this. Okay. And this is the encoder boundary point view. This is the encoder boundary point view we're looking at. Okay. Um, we're we're uh, we seem to have a slow link here this morning. All these viewers. There you go. No, it's a, it's a live event, and whenever you do a live event, things don't work. Mm. Of course. So let me try. Uh, there you go. It's slowly coming in. Let me see if I can. No. All right, I think we're probably not going to be able to demo this this morning because it looks like we're. Let me just take one last crack at this, and if it doesn't work, then we'll just uh, we'll just give up. Always something goes wrong when you're trying to do a demo. <laughs> okay, that's looking a little better. Let's see if we can get there. There you go. Okay. Let me just pick a, a time frame that I checked out this morning, made sure all was well. And this is looking much more encouraging. Ah. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a series, <coughs> excuse me, of thumbnails for, for one, two, three. In this case, you can okay. see four, ver four variants. I think there's, there's five of them here in this set. Uh, and very directly, you can see blue boxes around the, uh, the frames that okay. have EBP markers in them. So, righto. Um, so this this is this is real simple. You can look okay. at this. If the boxes are blue, it's in alignment. Okay. Um, now I don't have an example of them turning red because okay. because really we couldn't do that enough time here to make mm -hmm. that. Uh, make but we that. can imagine what the you, red you box can imagine. Looks like. <laughs> if these are out of alignment, they will be displayed. They'll yeah. be displayed in rough visual alignment, but those boxes will be red. So okay. you can instantly observe that there's gotcha. something wrong. And like everything else I've okay. talked about, you don't have to actually have eyes on glass to gotcha. watch this. You can alarm on it. Right. Uh, and then you can come in and look at this and, and, yep. uh, and do whatever you need to do. So that was a very quick demo, okay. and I'm sorry we had a bit of a technical glitch there, but uh, but that's the, the capability for that on DBA. That's fine. And then um, the one other note I would say on the having the encoder boundary points lined up is anything downstream will have a hard time if it's not. So oh, any sure. downstream packagers or origin servers, mm -hmm. um, it's almost like the buffer <laughs> issue in the beginning of, of burstiness. So Got to make sure the video is right, both... Mm -hmm. um, Boundary point wise, GOP alignment wise, as well as um, burstiness not being there. Sure. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on. So that's, I think, the five, the major five pit, fit, pitfalls that we were going to talk about. But yep. there's there's some more things in there. Yep. Um, different encoders might not have the capacity to do 4K. 4K is a lot more processing than H.264 sure. 4K or, um, or, or HD. Um, mistiming of multi-audio tracks, we've seen that, so that mm. kind of falls in line with the, the video. Um, there is more complexity with 4K video. There's a higher frame rate, there's a different codec, there's, like I said, I didn't even mention HDR. Sure, um, yeah, we haven't even talked there's, about there's that. There's 8-bit, 10-bit, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. um, a whole other world of this stuff. And then using a low-end encoder that can't handle the ability to do a 4K plus HD and SD on the same box. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those are a few other things to watch out for as you go okay. through this. Back to our second poll question. So I will read the question. 
if you're an operator or OVP. When is your company planning to launch a 4K service? Ooh, this one's a little bit more mixed. <laughs> so what we're seeing is uh, option D, take a th- wait and see approach ra- right around 32%, followed up by B, 12 months from now, about a 27%, we'll be seeing more 4K content. Mm, okay. So, so a little bit more than a quarter are committed to the next year or so doing right. this. And I guess there's a lot of people sitting on the fence. Yeah. Wait, waiting to see what's going to happen. So, so that's, that's curious. Yep. All right. Very All right, so that wraps up the uh, material we were planning to to present in terms yep. of the top five pitfalls, plus a few others which we've just run over at the moment. Okay. So I think it's now time for us to take questions from uh, from you, the audience. So if you have a question, we invite you to submit them. Yep. We'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can in the time that we've got available. Uh, and I can see from our little prompter, we have a number of very good questions up here already. Yep. So, um, Tom, why don't you take us through those questions? And- sure. So... Uh, the first question, do most 4K <laughs> television sets have a HEVC codec, and will video be an 8 or 10-bit? Uh, I think the, the answers are probably yes, yes, and yes on that. Yeah, I think that's probably the simplest answer there. Yeah, so the um, from what I'm seeing, 4K with 10-bit, that they go together. You mm-hmm. won't see a lot Absolutely, of 4K yeah. 8-bit out in the world. And that really relates to our second question, which is about 422 color chroma encoding, ah, and that's okay. that's typically with the 10-bit stuff. So, okay. So, um, very good. Um, and then 4K TV sets have an HEVC decoder. Yes. Mm-hmm. We're testing the Samsungs, the LGs, the Sonys, the Toshibas, sure. Panasonics, as well as, don't forget the set-top boxes. Absolutely, them. Yeah, that's key. So the Broadcoms, the ST Micros, the MSTARs, all of those guys have had HEVC 4K decoding chipsets for a while now. And, and let's not forget mobile handsets, which, uh, which are right. also playing a big part in this ecosystem. So, Gotcha. So let's move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, what is the most common output format or protocol for 4K that you're seeing? Mm, interesting. So I'm, I'm assuming this is an ABR-related question. Uh, so I think you know certainly what we're seeing by far is uh, HLS is okay. the is the most common output format for this by by a wide margin. Okay. So here, here's what I'm going to disagree. I understand yeah. you're something different. <laughs> for us, we we started off adding it with MPEG Dash, mm-hmm. and most of the recent demos we've done have been MPEG Dash. So um, our very first 4K was MPEG Dash with the ISO BMF format. We, have, we support HLS also, so it sure. it's, doesn't really matter either way. But um, from the decoders we're working with to the set-top boxes, we've been testing most often with MPEG Dash. So. Now, what about your customers? Are you seeing MPEG Dash widely deployed in customers, or are you? It's 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 hitting. Um, I don't know if you'd call it a sweet spot, or um, we're we're in the mode now where there's actually customers deployed with it. Okay. So last year at this time, it was still like a lot of trials, but now we're, we have people in production with MPEG Dash. Okay, very good. Okay. So what's what's up next? Next question. Uh, what is the single most common mistake early providers of 4K are making? I think... I think that would probably be our pitfall number one, really, which you know I could characterize as not tuning your network pro- properly for 4K. Okay. So the working with the assumption that my network is delivering, you know, my customers are very happy with my HD signal. I've got high CSAT ratings. Everything's good. Uh, I can just crank 4K down that network, and it'll work just as well. Gotcha. I think that's the thing we're seeing most often. There's an awful lot of tuning of networks happening out there as 4K okay. service starts. Yep. I think that's the single common largest one. I agree. <laughs> All right, next up. Uh, what? Okay. Uh, what bandwidth would typically be required for 4K and HDR and high frame rate? Is 14 megabits realistic? So I'll answer that one. Please, um, go ahead. So we've done a lot of work here. Mm-hmm. And what we're seeing is in the over-the-top world, where you're delivering over an unmanaged public network, you don't have the luxury of streaming a live event at 30 megabits. There's just not enough people that have that big a pipe. Mm-hmm. So 
Um, the, the fact that you have 14 megabits is what we've been seeing. That actually works pretty well be when you take into to account the fact you're streaming through some CDN. So the CDN ingest point mm -hmm. is usually has some fixed ceiling as well. Yeah, I think we mentioned that earlier. So you mentioned that earlier. So um, yes, 4K, um, HEVC at a higher frame rate, a P50 or P60 at 14 megabits is possible okay. for a live event. Okay, good. So now for broadcast quality, that's probably for for uh, broadcast quality is a good term. Yeah, broadcast. for broadcast quality, that's probably not a not a realistic number. You're probably looking at something quite a bit higher than that. But I'd say 20, 25, even yeah. high as 30. Um, some of the early demos we did, World Cup wise, mm -hmm. where they had a satellite. You know, they owned the pipe basically. Sure. Um, that's about the range we were seeing, 25 to 35. Okay, all right. That was a year and a half ago, so things are only getting better. <laughs> yeah. Well, and HEVC implementations are probably getting tighter, so you're getting more compression occurring, and, right. and uh, you know, bit rate will, to some extent, come down. Yep. Okay, next question. Uh, I'll... Actually, I'll, I'll take that second question. Okay. <clears throat> somebody, somebody writes in, I thought I heard you say that 150 megabps is uh, required for consumer quality 4K with AVC, and isn't that too high? Um, yep, you definitely heard me say that. I think where, that, where we're seeing that, I'll, let, I'll stop you. Okay, jump in. Um, we're seeing that 150 megabit H.264 bit rate in a contribu contribution scenario. Perfect, that's okay. what I was going to say. Okay. Yep, that, 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 that's exactly the answer. Okay. <clears throat> and, and I guess the other thing to mention here, of course, is like everything else, this is content related, right? Right. But, but it has exactly been in a contribution scenario where we've seen this. Yep. So the, the 150 megabits would be that signal is ha coming from some event or venue, and that's how it gets to DirecTV or Comcast or yep. some other... BT service provider before they can distribute it. At that point, it's going in. It's probably being transcoded, massaged, right. crunched, yep. Yep. <laughs> and off it Converted goes. Converted to HEVC. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think that next one's perfect for, uh, for Elemental. The HEVC encoder. <laughs> so, yes, the HEVC encoder. Uh, the question here is... HVC encoding needs nearly six times compared to H.264. I actually think it's higher. Oh, all right. It's, it's a ten times. Wow, okay. We have a different white paper from a, a while ago about HVC and processing. Um, you think such operators' infrastructures are ready to handle such scale? So the, the complexity here for HVC is really in two places. Um, actually, three, I'll say. Okay. So the, the head-end encoder... Mm -hmm. needs a lot more processing to drive down that bit rate and maintain the quality. The HEVC decoder needs the ability sure. to decode that more complex codec, so higher processing requirements. Now, that's generally reputed to be two to three times more okay. compute complexity than two, on the decode side. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, okay. I believe that. Um, and then networking-wise, the transmission of it, it's just bits, so it's, yeah. it's not dramatically different. I would say the monitoring equipment. Needs to be different. The monitoring equipment updated. clearly is dealing with much higher bit rates, so it's either going to end up having to be more powerful to maintain the same capacity, yep. or do fewer bigger streams. Right, um, and if you're those are all trade offs you can make. And if you're doing a MOS score on an HEVC, you're going to need more much compute. more compute power. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. So okay, next. So question. are are but 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 are networks ready for this? I would say the answer is solve that that far end problem, the set top box, the whatever. Right. Uh, and the rest I would say the complexity is really contained within the encoding element. Right. So as long as you buy an encoding element that's competent and able to do this, as you said, the rest is just bits that you're shoveling through the network. Right. As long as they're not bursty. Then as long as they're not bursty, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Uh, can an adaptive bitrate set of an uh, adaptive bitrate set of streams include a mix of H.264 and H.265 encoded streams? So, I would say yes, and okay. it's really a function of, of what the target device set is. Right. So if you're if you're targeting 4K TVs and you know mobile devices, uh, you may end up having to do that in the right. same set simply to be able to support all the devices that you're planning to receive that particular set of stuff. Yep. So absolutely, and we've seen that happen quite a bit. Yep, I would say, I put you on the spot there, but yes. That's okay. I, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, yes. 
Um, it can, and the there has been a kind of a theory of, well, I'll make the really high-end HDs, make those HEBC, and make everything else below that H.264. Mm-hmm. Um, most modern, you know, decoders can handle that. So, yep. or you might also split it up so that a target of the H.264s only go to certain devices, and exactly. the full suite goes to another suite. Yep. So, yeah, we've seen that kind of. We thing. have packagers that can, yep. you know, yep. per device, pick out which. On the fly manifests and all sorts of things like that to exactly. deal with this. Yeah. Yep. Okay, next question. Oh, I love this next question. What's the ideal bit rate to encode 4K? Um, you know, I think the quick answer is there isn't a quick answer. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yep. Again, very content dependent uh, and also very much device dependent. Where, where are you sending it? So right. There really isn't a good answer to that, I don't think. There is no ideal bit rate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What's up next? Uh, okay. That's the next one. Keep scrolling. What about HT encoding? Won't that need to change? Um, how do you align multiple encoders to form a minimum bit rate for 4K? Oh my! Well, we got some really detailed. Yeah. <laughs> we got some really detailed questions here. <laughs> yeah. Can we go back up? You know, there's one there. Somebody's obviously put a lot of work into. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'd like to read that and just tell them. Okay. We'll, we'll get back to them with an with an email answer. That's too sure. big for for this this format. Um, I can handle the HD encoding for a 4K display. Okay. Um, so the question here is, what about HD encoding for a 4K display? Won't that need to change too, since the new display will show the flaws? From what I've seen, if you do the HD fairly well, then the scaling in the, that's built into the 4K monitors is pretty good. Um, yeah, we were talking about that yesterday, and I, yeah. think I, I think I heard you say it's really very difficult side by side to tell the difference between an upscaled HD and a native 4K on right. a 4K set. If you have a good 4K set that's got right. a good upscaler in it. And if you're not a video person Correct. like you or I, yeah, then... We might spot the differences a little more easily. Right, we'd yeah. see the softness and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I'll answer the top one since we have enough time here. Okay, sure, yep. So how do you align multiple encoders to form an adaptive bitrate set? Um, there's no standard on how to do this. The, the way that we do it is we have two encoders running simultaneously and they're just communicating between each other mm-hmm. so that they're aligning the segments. Um, I think it's based on time code, honestly, is how we do it for the input time code and then we align the two encoders so that the outputs always match. Well, the re- so. this may also be referring to the to the encoder boundary point mechanism, yep. whereby you can you can line up. I don't know if the question was 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 GOPs or segments, but okay. certainly encoder boundary points can be used right. to line up segments, and and most encoders support that uh, gotcha. that mechanism as well. So yep. that may be the answer the questioner was looking for. Okay, um, I think I think there is a standard for that. Okay, um, some done done a few years ago. We we can get back to the questioner with that number. Gotcha. So there's a great question here. I'm just going to read this question and say we'll have to get back to you with an email answer for this because it's uh, um, uh, pretty detailed. Could you explain at a somewhat high level the video behavior a user would see if the content is encoded with a long GOP or a shorter UHD HEVC at I mean, that must have been 23.98. Mm-hmm. At 23.98 frames per second, progressive at constant bit rate, and what's the best practice? So we have about, oh, two or three minutes left, and I don't <laughs> think we can do justice to that question in two or three minutes. Yeah. But, uh, but to the questioner, we will get back to you with, uh, with an email answer on that. Yeah. Oh, that's a tough one. That is a tough that, one. This is an opinion question here. Yeah. Um, we'll read it. Okay. Uh, do you believe the recent statements about adjusting licensing fees by HEVC Advance are calming any nervousness that may have been slowing down HEVC and thus 4K adoption? You know, I'm going to jump in here and okay. say I, I think uh, I think some of this actually may be driving that. What was it, 32 percent or so we saw taking a wait and see approach? Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, there, there, there. Clearly, there is nervousness out there. Right. And, and as you said, this is an opinion question. We don't really have a 
you know, a definitive answer for that. Yeah. Um, but I think yes, you know, in short, yes, I think it's calming some of it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So do we have time for about one more question, maybe? Sure. Okay. Related to the 264 and 265 mix, would the end device be able to switch between 264 and 265 in real time without a glitch? So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, and can you ex elaborate on that? Yeah, just a bit? so <laughs> what we've seen is some can and some can't. Exactly. So um, if you are a, a managing your network, you know which devices you're going to in the home, um, that's an option. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to blast out this to the World Wide Web with, with no care for clients, then that would probably more, be more challenging. That would be more dangerous yep. for sure, yeah. So. Okay, so I think that's probably all the time we have for questions. I see okay. we're just about uh, just about at the end of our allocated time. So thank you everybody for uh, for for some excellent questions. Uh, we will get back with answers, the ones we've talked about that we were unable to do justice to in this particular format. But uh, I think it's time for us to to wrap up. Okay. So you know we originally thought about calling this webcast. Uh, no place to hide, uh, <laughs> and I and I think that really mm -hmm. is a great way of describing the whole 4K phenomena. Uh, we have talked about higher data rates, higher frame rates, larger viewing areas. All of these things mean that if anything goes wrong, the uh, the viewing audience is much more likely to notice it than they uh, they probably could have been, you know, in, in right. an HD environment. And and keep in mind, they're expecting much more and they're paying for much more. Right. So when you do 4K service, when you offer 4K commercial. Service, Service, you really need to keep this in mind and make sure, you know, to the extent that you understand your audience is basically expecting perfection, right. that you're delivering something close enough to perfection that they're not going to notice the difference. Right. So this involves a whole lot of trade-offs in your network. We've just talked about uh, engineering variable bit rates and yep. engineering uh, um, what kind of encoder you're using and how to deal with burstiness. There's all kinds of things you need to think about here. So understand that. Um, make sure your network is actually sized to deal with this thing. So this is the this is the higher bit rate. Make right. sure you're not trying to fall for pitfall number one and try yep. to squeeze it down a pipe that you already have. Get a good encoder for 4K. That's probably the most critical thing you can do. Hey, all right. That is, that is absolutely <laughs> important. Um, set good monitoring thresholds. Right. So I can't emphasize enough this being a new technology and typically a new codec critically important to be monitoring the output of those encoders in real time so you can catch any quality escapes that occur, jump on those before your customers do. That's really yep. important as well. And remember, in the end, I think the last point we have here, there are no cookie cutter solutions. Every network is different. Every yep. network's going to have its own set of delivery challenges and its own set of encoding challenges. Yep. So we, we, we put this in here somewhere, but basically understand very carefully what 4K is all about. It's a complex beast. There's a lot of things to think about. Yep. Make sure that you're completely on top of that before you start delivering 4K service. Sounds good. So I think that's it. And uh, with that, yes. I'll hand it back to Brandon. Thank you, Michael. Um, I wanted to also just quickly reiterate something that Michael and Tom said there toward the end. If you asked a question and we did not get a chance to answer that here in the webcast, we will follow up with you individually in the next several days. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for today's live webcast. An archive of this webcast will be available on the Elemental website. To learn more about perfecting 4K video delivery, we invite you to read a corresponding joint solution brief. Look in your inbox for information about accessing this joint solution brief or visit our website. We also hope you'll join us for the next in our series of Elemental Insights webcasts in January. That session will discuss how to create resilient live broadcasts leveraging cloud infrastructure. We look forward to seeing you again. From all of us at Elemental and in AOQuest, we wish you and your families a safe and happy holiday season. This concludes our webcast.